Greetings, senior colleagues. My name is Brian MacArthur, Acting Deputy Vice Chancellor and Head of the College of Law and Management Studies. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the eighth webinar session of the African Ombudsman Research Center in 2021. It is also my honor to welcome our esteemed panel. Chairperson of the African Ombudsman Research Center, IOC Board, President of the African Ombudsman and Mediators Association, and Public Protector of South Africa, Advocate Busisiwe Mkwebani. Public Protector of Zambia, Honorable Caroline Sokoni. Acting Ombudsman of Namibia, Advocate John Walters. General Secretary of the IOI and Ombudsman of Austria, Mr. Werner Amon. It also gives me great pleasure to welcome the new Ombudsman of Malawi and our facilitator this morning, Honorable Grace Malera. Greetings too to all colleagues in attendance. Thank you for availing yourselves to attend today's important discussion. Colleagues, these are unprecedented times. If we only take into account the ongoing global pandemic and the far reaching implications it has had so far, it is not unimaginable that the challenges arising from COVID-19 will continue long after society returns to a greater period of stability. We therefore recognize that the knock-on effect on the lives and livelihoods of countless people and organizations has not made the Ombudsman offices exempt. Remote working has become necessary for many staff and productivity inevitably challenged. The mandate of the Ombudsman has always been good governance and accountability. Independent and impartial with credible review processes when proceeding with the authority and responsibility bestowed. But global pressures and needs are accelerating for better and for worse. Formidable global challenges and rapid developments in issues such as human rights, challenges to independence, corruption across sectors, health, communications, conflict, the environment, and at times the absence of public probity proliferate. This requires us to seek continuous and rigorous strengthening of the mandates of the Ombudsman in practical and effective ways, as well as through articulating dialogue and triggering coordination between authorities, international and civil society organizations, as well as including the victims themselves. Preserving and protecting the rights of the populations served Na preservação and protection dos direitos. Speaking truth into power and ensuring redress for citizens when they have been failed, as well as identifying trends and best practices in public policy making, is indeed a work in progress. This rigorous testing and review to equip the Ombudsman with tools to deliver on needs and wants means both high level engagement and sometimes simply putting one's ear to the ground. The ability to reach the sections of society most in need, meet the expectations of individuals and to manage change effectively in what are currently testing circumstances is yet another opportunity to rise to the occasion. By gathering here today, we are assured that the commitment to be of service to society is unshakable. I look forward to the discussion and outcomes tabled today and express my gratitude to you all once again for joining us. It is now my Kobani who will formally welcome you as the chairperson of IOC. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mc 
Atha for always, always being supportive to uh, Ayok, um, the Ombudsman family, and also acknowledge um, you as the Deputy Vice Chancellor and Head um, University of KwaZulu Natal. And uh, also welcome um, Honorable Grace Malera, the Ombudsman of Malawi. Uh, we welcome you to this uh, Ombudsman family as the new uh, incoming Ombudsman. And uh, also thank uh, the outgoing uh, Ombudsman of uh, Namibia, uh, Advocate John Waters and uh, acknowledge uh, Honorable Soponi, the public protector of Zambia, and uh, thank uh, always uh, the assistance and participation of uh, IOI, the General Secretary, Mr. Amon uh, from uh, Australia. So it is an honor for us as public protector South Africa, as the chairperson of the of IOC African Ombudsman and Mediators, um, Association and uh, as the president of uh, uh, IOMA, I would uh, appreciate it uh, that uh, you always also participate and we can see the participation. Mine as the president of IOMA, I would uh, for information purposes always mention that we appreciate um, the hard work which is uh, done by IOC, our research center. IOMA is an institution, a, a, a continental and umbrella body of 44 ombudsman and mediators institution across the continent. And uh, this is inclusive of additional four sectoral uh, ombudsman institution, three of which are from South Africa. So it exists to advance the ideals of good governance, human rights in Africa, by supporting and promoting the independence and development of Ombudsman institution in the continent. So its vision is to be a leading international association of Ombudsman uh, offices, practitioners and scholars dedicated to the promotion of open, accountable, people-centered uh, democratic uh, and democracy in Africa. I need to indicate that um, IOMA leadership, we have um, uh, uh, IOMA leadership, which is appointed at IOMA General Assembly. The current one was appointed in Rwanda in 2018. I'm the president of IOMA and we have two vice uh, presidents, one from Burkina Faso, another one from uh, uh, Sudan. In fact, no, uh, the other one is from Libya. And then we also have the general secretary general from Kenya and the deputy secretary general from Seychelles. Our treasurer was from uh, Malawi, but then we will have to discuss because that position is vacant after the departure of Honorable uh, Chizuma. And the deputy secretary is from the, uh, was from the Central African Republic, but we've got challenges and also will have to fill that position. But then we have six regional coordinators who are coordinating the whole of Africa, which is Northern Africa and uh, Southern Africa, Western Africa, Eastern Africa, uh, Indian uh, Ocean and Central Africa. So all ombudsmen um, in the uh, world, uh, in fact, in Africa, we are led and we are complying to the OR Tambo minimum standards and the very same uh, OR Tambo minimum standards have some elements of it in the Venice principles, which uh, the uh, Secretary General of IOI will address us on. So those standards are saying each Ombudsman uh, uh, institution must be uh, 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 independent and have autonomy and uh, the establishment of such institutions that is preferably guaranteed in the constitution. So most of us, uh, we are guaranteed in our constitutions, uh, individual um, states uh, constitutions, and the security of tenure for such heads of such institutions is guaranteed. So um, we also have mandates, we should be provided with uh, resources, uh, operations, and should be accessible, and we should uh, operate with impartiality and accountability. 
So the standards are aligned to Article 15 of 2011 AU's African Charter on Democracy, Elections and Governance, which deals with the establishment of support and effectiveness of ombudsman institutions and other institutions supporting democracy. So one of the challenges facing ombudsman institutions in Africa is the reality that um, the anatomies of such institutions across the continent still varies from one country to another. In addition, such institutions do not exist in uh, other uh, African countries. So the standards is to make sure that we work very closely with the African uh, Union. Uh, we have the observer status there. And uh, as you know that um, all ombudsmen, we are contributing to agenda 2063 of the African Union to create the Africa we want into reality. And in particular, I want uh, to indicate that we are focusing all our energies on the third and fourth aspirations of the Agenda 2063, which deals with good governance, democracy, respect for human rights, justice and the rule of law, and peace and security, respectively. This includes um, the continental um, efforts to silence the guns by 2020, which unfortunately uh, that has not been achieved, but I think let's assist the continent to strive and achieve that. So the African Ombudsman Research Center, um, as uh, Professor MacArthur has indicated, this is the eighth webinar and uh, we are thankful for your, their work. They are responsible for research, information sharing, capacity building and advocacy. Um, we have, yes, the challenges of funding, but then I must indicate that we are working with all institutions, all governments to make sure that they also assist. Most of the time, the South African government was the one which was funding us. But now since we have also moved our secretariat to IOC, we are hoping that member states with their contributions will assist us to keep this very critical and credible institution into operation so that we can continue to have such engagements. In uh, closing, let's stay safe. Um, the pandemic is still with us, is still creating a lot of challenges and it, it is also creating a lot of work for us because now we have situations where countries are violating human rights of people and uh, we need to be on the lookout and make sure that we intervene since our critical mandate also is mediation, alternative dispute resolution. So let's make sure that we intervene. We also sensitize our governments on how to always be uh, on the lookout and protect the rights of uh, uh, institutions. Thank you so much for this opportunity and welcome to everyone. I'm looking forward to the very uh, uh, important, this important uh, 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 session and to learn because the, you, 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 we don't step, uh, stop learning. I'll hand over back to Honorable uh, Malera and to then continue facilitating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Advocate Ko. Kowani, for those very inspiring remarks, um, highlighting the background of the IOMA and also highlighting some of the salient issues that we'll be addressing in this webinar today. And also I would like to thank Professor um, MacArthur for those very inspiring welcoming remarks that um, you gave us. Um, good morning and welcome to this webinar this morning. I am privileged, as Marion said, to actually be the facilitator of this webinar. And as Marion said, it's um, in a way a baptism by fire because I'm still counting and I am 14 days in the office. But when the offer to facilitate was extended to me, I did not hesitate to accept because I thought this would actually be the best way for me to learn from all the eminent 
persons that are going to speak us, to us this morning. Our webinar is on strengthening the mandate of the Ombudsman. And as uh, Prof aptly put it, we are up against a lot of formidable challenges in terms of um, emerging human rights issues, in terms of the COVID pandemic. And I would also add that the ever increasing demand on the services of our offices, the huge expectations that our citizens have. Um, so it's important that today we've got our eminent resource persons helping us to share their perspectives and insights on um, the importance of strengthening the mandate of the offices of Ombudsman and uh, looking at the best ways of doing this. What have we learned over the past years that we have been in operation? What's been working? What has not worked? And what do we need to take to scale? Joining me for this webinar are three eminent resource persons that are going to speak to us. I'll briefly introduce them. We will be joined by Honorable Caroline Chuma Zulu Sokoni. She's the public protector from Zambia. And I think she's no stranger to any one of us. She holds a law degree as well as a master's in law um, in criminology from Queen Mary and Westfield College, University of London, United Kingdom. Before assuming the role of Ombudsman, she has been a state advocate and also an acting deputy public um, prosecutor in Zambia. We will also be joined by advocate John Waters. He needs no introduction. I had the privilege of working with him when I was in the Human Rights Commission. Um, he is the current acting Ombudsman. Um, for Namibia, quite an illustrious career when we look at his CV. Uh, he's been a career prosecutor, magistrate, he's worked in private practice. I would call him an all-rounder of sorts. And then joining us through video, we will have Honorable Wena Amon, the Ombudsman of Austri Austria. Um, he's been a member of parliament for 25 years. He's been chair, chair, he's the chairman, he was the chairman of the Austrian delegation to the Council of Europe and the vice president of the Council of Europe's parliamentary assembly. He now is the Ombudsman of Austria. In uh, giving the floor to the first speaker this morning, Honorable Caroline Chuma, I would like to highlight the key areas that I would like for our panelists to address us this morning. We would like to listen to you and um, your perspectives on why now, ever than before, we have a need to strengthen the mandate of the Ombudsman. And what would be the practical and effective tools to empower the Ombudsman to execute their mandate optimally? Um, both Advocate Nkowani and um, uh, Prof spoke about the need to embed our offices um, in the in constitutions of our countries, they need to resource us effectively. But do we stop there? Some offices like the Malawi Ombudsman is embedded in the constitution and the independence and autonomy is enshrined in the constitution. But we still continue to face impediments to our effective operation. What more needs to be done? How can we get pragmatic? All the discussions will be premised on the Venice principles and the UN resolution on the protection and promotion on the role of the Ombudsman. And this will be taken by um, Ombudsman Amon. So without much ado and in the interest of time, allow me to invite Advocate um, Honorable Caroline Chuma, Zulu Sokoni, Public Protector of Zambia to make her presentation. Um, Honorable, you've got 15 minutes to address us. To those that have joined us, a warm welcome. And I would like to emphasize that um, you will be posting your questions on the chat session. All these will be collated and our panelists will address them in due course because we are not going to have a live Q and A session. Thank you.
you have the floor. Honorable Caroline, you would you like to unmute? Unmute, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Malera. And thank you for the opening remarks also from uh, Professor MacArthur and um, uh, Professor and uh, Advocate um, Kwevani, Public Protector of South Africa. Why is there a need to strengthen the mandates of the Ombudsman? Um, the Office of the Ombudsman is um, a unique institution in that it investigates the very institution which fa facilitates the crea its creation. The Office of the Ombudsman is a creature born out of the political will of the government. Political will refers to the active commitment by the government of the day to pursue and seek to achieve through stakeholder consultation, a particular policy objective which process subsequently legitimizes the implementation of the policy with the passing into law of the supporting legislative, institutional, and financial framework. There can be said to be lack of political will if there is a lack of commitment at any stage of the formulation, development, and implementation of the policy objective. Thus, um, the we can say the office of the ombudsman is um, um, a creature of political will. There has to be immense political will for the office of the ombudsman to exist. The nature of an ombudsman work is to investigate maladministration. Maladministration is the root cause of corruption. It is often referred to as petty corruption, yet often the impact of both corruption and maladministration have deep reverberations in the public service delivery system. It is no small injury when a member of the public is unfairly hindered, hindered from gaining access to the services that he deserves as of right, even though the, the financial impact may not be felt on a macroeconomic level. Maladministration may be termed petty corruption simply because of some of the activities, some of the activities such as discourtesy, to give one example, have negligible effects on the government's resources. However, in terms of the law, maladministration is as much an offense as corruption and more so because it breeds crime. One of the classic definitions of maladministration is that it refers to administrative action or inaction based on or influenced by improper considerations or conducts. The implications of placing an institution in the precarious position of investigating an, 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 an administration to which it is answerable, raised a conundrum for the founding fathers of ombudsmanship. The problem begged for an airtight solution in order to consolidate the independence and integrity of the ombudsman institution. In the classical model developed in Sweden, the ombudsman was made answerable to parliament in order to ensure that the government would free, freely make the public service officials answerable to them. In other words, making the ombudsman answerable to parliament where the representatives of the people congregate in order to make laws, ensure that public service officials could not choose government bureaucracy or officialdom in order to negate the investigations of the ombudsman. Thus it came to pass that the ombudsman is appointed and answerable to the legislature. The doctrine of separation of powers helps to it is the ombudsman into a much more preferable position. The conflict of interest arising from investigating the same body which can appoint and dismiss the ombudsman was wisely resolved by placing the ombudsman right at the center of the doctrine of the separation of powers. This is evidenced by the fact that the legislature appoints, or in some instances, the legislature recruits the ombudsman Competitive process and then recommends the head of the, the ombudsman is made accountable to legislature and this provides the required checks and balances in order to secure to further secure the independence of the office of the ombudsman. In some um, um, jurisdictions, termination of employment is uh, also handled by the legislature. 
In other systems, they are, the president appoints the ombudsman subject to ratification by the legislature. Termination of employment is carried out in a procedure similar to removal from office of judges. The job of the judiciary in the triangular arrangement of the separation of powers in strengthening the mandate of the ombudsman is to provide the conditions of service which are drawn from the judiciary. They need to further strengthen the mandate of the ombudsman in the area of terms and conditions of service became glaringly clear as it was not possible for a low level ranking ombudsman to investigate high ranking government officials and require them to comply with the recommendations of the ombudsman when an inquiry regarding maladministration was lying against them. The position of the of ombudsman has therefore in many jurisdictions been equated that of the high ranking judicial office of a judge with all the accompanying powers of the office, except the power to make binding decisions. The position has also been vested with the conditions of service and remuneration of a judge in many, many jurisdictions. However, is the lack of power to make binding decisions, which has attracted wide debate as to whether the ombudsman must be vested with the equivalent enforcement powers as those of the courts of law when the final investigative report is submitted for implementation. Once recommendations for the remedial action is required to be taken by errant public service officials or an entity whose public service delivery falls short of the required standards in a classical ombudsman system, the ultimate enforcement mechanism open to the ombudsman is to submit the report to the legislature's committee system. The question often asked of the ombudsman is as to whether stopping at the point of making recommendations when finalizing the investigative report is sufficient for enforcement purposes. In Zambia, the mandate of the public protector was strengthened by making the recommendations issued in the final reports binding. The provisions were couched very clearly and there was no ambiguity at all. The constitution of Zambia under Article 244, subclause 5, state, states as follows. The public protector has the same powers as those of the high court in enforcing the attendance of witnesses and examining them on oath examining witnesses outside Zambia, compelling the production of documents, enforcing decisions issued by the public protector, citing a person or an authority for contempt for failure to carry out a decision. A, a person someone to give evidence or to produce a document before the public protector is entitled in respect of that evidence or the production of the document to the same privileges and protection as those that a person would be entitled to before a court. Furthermore, the Constitution of Zambia states that one must be qualified to be a judge in order to be eligible for appointment to the Office of Public Protector. And it further states that removal of the Public Protector from office shall be the same as that of a judge. All these measures were put in place in order to strengthen the mandate of the Office of the Public Protector. However, in the case of the Public Protector for the Republic of Zambia and in Indeni Petroleum Refinery, the public protector appealed on a preliminary, ma preliminary matter to the constitutional court on the ground that the reports of the public protector were not amenable to judicial review since the office of the public protector enjoyed equivalent powers to the high court pursuant to the constitutional provisions. The constitutional court on page J15 of their judgment, however, held in Saelia that the provisions of the constitution provided for a restricted jurisdiction for the public protector, which was specific and restricted to investigations of allegations of maladministration by state institution. The Constitutional Court observed that in contrast to the jurisdiction of the public protector, the jurisdiction of the High Court was unlimited and original for civil and criminal matters, appellate and supervisory jurisdiction, and jurisdiction to review decisions in accordance to the law. The Constitutional Court, of course, however, looked at the fact that their jurisdiction is also limited to constitutional matters and there can be no appeal from their decisions. The Zambian Constitutional Court further relied on the South African authority of the Minister of Home Affairs versus the Public Protector, where the Supreme Court of South Africa stated regarding the Public Protector of South Africa that the Public Protector is not a court, does not exercise judicial power, and cannot be equated with a court. Her role is completely different to that of the courts and the jurisdictional arrangement for the courts are entirely irrelevant to a determination of the public protector's jurisdiction. 
it is necessary to look to Section 182 of the Constitution and the Public Protector Act to ascertain the bounds of the public protector's jurisdiction. Close quotes. The Constitutional Court of Zambia then went on to rule similarly in the, in the case of Zambia, of the, the Zambian public protector. They stated in Taalia that it is evident that the public protector is not a court. They further stated that the constitution does not contain any express provision which equates the public protector to the high court. The holding of the court, uh, of course, is in direct contrast to the provisions of the constitution. The reports of the public protector were after that ju judgment made amenable to judicial review. Thus, in the judgment delivered for the case of Indeni Petroleum Refinery Company and the public, public, public protector, which was in a, an application for judicial review by Indeni Petroleum Refinery against the ruling of the public protector to reinstate two former employees of the applicant institution, the High Court quashed the decision of the public protector for illegality, and the High Court observed on page 28 of their judgment that, open quote, it is therefore important that public bodies ought to always confine the exercise of their powers within the confines and parameters of the law and guard against being used for purposes other than that for which they were created. Again, this ruling was in direct contrast to the provisions of the Zaman Constitution, as the public protector had not acted out of virus. Indeed, the, the, the Constitution clearly states that the public pro, pro, protector shall hear an appeal by a person relating to an action or decision taken or omitted to be taken in respect of that person. And the constitution further states that the public protector may make a decision on an action to be taken against the public protector or constitutional office holder, which decision shall be implemented by appropriately. However, the High Court reasoned that once the office of the, um, the, the public protector had transitioned from being an executive ombudsman to a parliamentary ombudsman system, um, the public protector should not have used um, the provisions of uh, the public protector act to hear matters from complainants who had um, uh, um, complained during the era of uh, the investigator general, which, which was uh, the executive ombudsman system under which we were before we transitioned in, in, transitioned in 2016. I will move on to the, the South African example. Similarly, in the South African case of the economic freedom fighters versus the Speaker of the National Assembly, the mandate of the Public Protector South Africa was strengthened when the Constitutional Court of South Africa delivered its judgment which converted the recommendations of the Public Protector South Africa into binding decisions. The judgment concerned the powers of the Public Protector South Africa to take appropriate remedial action. The power to recommend appropriate remedial action is part of the constitutional powers of the Public Protector of South Africa. The Speaker of Parliament uh, um, in, in, in South Africa contended that the Public Protector South Africa's power to take remedial action merely amounted to recommendations and thus the remedial action was not binding. And the opposition in parliament who had taken the speaker to court over the matter insisted that the public protector's remedial action powers were binding on the concerned parties. The constitutional court disagreed with the speaker of parliament and ruled that the public protector's remedial action in an, in, in an investigative report were binding. Consequently, because the public protector's report um, uh, um, regarded corrupt practices by the Office of the State President, the Constitutional Court read the re remedial action issuing powers of the public protector much more broadly and thus made the recommendation for remedial action binding. Before this judgment, the re remedial recommendation of the public protector had always been taken as a mere recommendation which protected the public protector from litigation from government departments which were not happy with the findings of the public protector. As a consequence of the Constitutional Court of South Africa's eagerness to buttress the enforcement powers of the public protector in the Kandla judgment, the public protect protector's office fell afoul of the system 
when he did not deliver a politically correct ruling in his later report regarding the Reserve Bank of South Africa. The South African Constitutional Court in a majority judgment delivered on the 22nd of July, 2019, upheld North, the North Houtens High Court order issued in February, 2018, for the public protector to be held liable in her personal capacity for 15% of the legal fees in the case of the public protector versus the Reserve Bank of South Africa for procedural er errors which would have been easily corrected had the public protector South Africa's appropriate remedial action conclusion conclusions been left at the level of recommendations and not binding decisions. The facts of the case are that between 1986 and 1995, the Reserve Bank of South Africa lent colossal amounts of money to a company known as Bancorp. APSA acquired Bancorp in April of 1992. In 1997, the South African government began to pursue the repayment of Bancorp's. An audit of the loan transaction had elicited the information that fraud and maladministration characterized the financial assist assistance given by the Reserve Bank to Bancorp and by ex extension to APSA, who had purchased Bancorp. After various further internal inquiries, the matter was referred to the Office of the Public Protector, and after seven years, a report was issued by the Public Protector. The report was issued after um, the, 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 the judgment which had um, um, made uh, the, the, the remedial um, action recommendations of the Public Protector binding. Before the, the report was finalized, the public protector consulted with the complainants who were the government. However, she did not consult with, with the respondent institutions being APSA and the Reserve Bank of South Africa. In his dissenting judgment, Chief Justice Mohang summarized APSA and the Reserve Bank's objection to the public protector not having consulted with them as, as follows. The Reserve, Reserve Bank contended that the public protector failed to conduct a fair and unbiased investigation. This, it argues, constitutes a reasonable apprehension of bias that she met with the presidency and the state security agency just before publishing the final report. The, the, the quotation goes on. The Honorable, Reserve Bank I, of South Africa also- I have to intervene here? Yes, please. I, I, I would, yes, so if you could be winding down on, on your presentation so that we can move to the next speaker. I'll, I'll give you an Thank additional you. three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, just in, in conclusion, for the Zambia uh, uh, example, the constitution gave, gave powers to the public project that we're making binding decisions. And, um, and the constitutional court then held that uh, these binding decisions uh, are amenable to judicial review. And in the South African example, it was the constitutional courts which gave the public protector binding powers. And uh, in a subsequent case, because um, the, 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 the South African public protector had made a decision which was not agreeable to the establishment, therefore, then she was made to pay 15% of, of, of the co costs for the, 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 the applicants. So there has to be a middle of the, uh, uh, of the road uh, uh, agreement made between the judiciary, the, the legislature and the executive to say, if we give powers to this office, how are these powers going to be applied in order not to have the interfer uh, interference from any of the three arms of government? I'll give another example. In Ireland, there was a case, the Lost at Sea case, where the Ombudsman of Ireland sent a, 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 a case to Parliament for the endorsement of Parliament because she had, um, she had uh, recommended for compensation for the complainants. And uh, in her report, she stated that the, 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 the Parliament of I uh, Ireland used the WIP system in order to ensure that the report was never um, 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 endorsed by parliament in a way in which the comp complainant could be given um, the, the necessary compensation. So in the, in, in the Irish case, there was interference from pa parliament. Mm -hmm. So the mandate of the, 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 the ombudsman in Ireland at the time was weakened. So the point I think of this paper is to state that whenever the, uh, the mandate of the ombudsman is being strengthened, 
each of the uh, three arms of government need to come together and they, they need to agree that these are the powers that we are giving to this office. And when they give the powers to this office, they should all agree th that they will not, not be the, the political interference that has been that has been shown in the Irish case, the Lost at Sea case, the, 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 the references are given in my paper, and the, the, the case of the Public Protector South Africa and the Public Protector Zambia. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable Caroline. Um, a very insightful presentation there. Um, from the conclusion, what I'm able to draw is that um, the stronger our mandate is perceived, I think that is likely to raise some discomfort on the quarters of um, different players for different reasons. How do we keep forging forward in the face of all that adversity? When you were doing the comparative analysis of um, what has come from the courts in Ireland, in, in um, South Africa and in Zambia, I couldn't help it but to note that I think in litigation, therein lies an opportunity for us to access the courts and probably advance arguments that can go towards the further strengthening of the mandate of our institutions. But I think the key question still remains, what kind of arguments could this be? What can we learn from other jurisdictions? I also got um, carried away at the very beginning of your paper when you mentioned that as ombudsman officers, we are a creatures of political will. Um, we are sustained by commitment of our governments, probably the executive arm of governments, just how does this political will manifest itself? We know that, that sometimes it serves the interests of um, the powers that be to only show political will by word of mouth, but not necessarily follow through with the relevant actions. So how do we exploit all of these seemingly opportunities towards the actual strengthening of our offices? It's, uh, it's been an otherwise very insightful and informative presentation. I wouldn't attempt to summarize everything. I would like to believe that as I bring on Advocate Waters um, to carry on from where you've left, probably there will be also issues from your paper that will flow into his own presentation. So Advocate uh, John, I, I give you the floor. Um, like with uh, Honorable Caroline, you also have got 15 minutes. Um, the floor is yours, thank you. Advocate Waters, if you are able to unmute yourself, please. Thank you. That is that so. I always forget it, but you can take into consideration my age. It is natural to forget. Uh, good morning and good afternoon for colleagues in other parts of the world. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and allow me to start by stating the obvious. An obvious uh, an ombudsman can exist and perform his or her task only within a system called a democracy governed by the rule of law. The fundamental principle of the rule of law is that government is subject to the law and not above. We all know uh, that the ombudsman is a creature of statute and accordingly his or her powers are limited to those conferred by statute. His or her jurisdiction is, is established by uh, uh, the law. The ombudsman cannot exercise uh, powers which are not expressly stated in the Ombudsman Act or constitution. However, there may be instances where authority may be implied in order not to defeat the purpose of the Act. For instance, uh, the Ombudsman Act of Namibia does not authorize the Ombudsman to conduct investigations uh, on own motion. That is an inferred uh, 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 duty. Also, the Ombudsman does not have 
the power to visit a places of detention unannounced or, or uh, establish regional offices. Again, the Ombudsman interprets his legislations purposefully, purposefully in order not to defeat the purpose of the act. But what are the right tools to empower the Ombudsman to execute their duties optimally? First and foremost, the legislation. Uh, it must give the Ombudsman all the powers that are necessary to adequately fulfill his or her mandate. In order to ensure the effective functioning of the Ombudsman, his or her mandate must first be inscribed either in the constitution or the enabling legislation. The mandate must be clearly defined in the, in the enabling legislation. The Ombudsman Act must provide for all the duties and powers of the Ombudsman because his or her budget is integrally linked to these powers and duties. Secondly, independence is a key characteristic of the Ombudsman's position and central to his or her effectiveness. The independent or independence of the Ombudsman must be based on or regulated by law, preferably in the constitution. The requirement of independence comprise, comprises three distinct aspects. Institutional independence, functional independence, and personal independence in terms of legal status. Shortly, independent, institutional independence means that the Ombudsman is not part of any of the powers of the state and certainly not of any of the bodies subject to his or her scrutiny. Functional independence, this means that the Ombudsman must be free from any outside pressure. The Ombudsman must be free to interpret his competence, use his powers of investigation and formulate his own uh, decisions. To function effectively, the Ombudsman must be provided with an adequate level of funding to guarantee his or her independence and his or her ability to, def to freely determine his or her priorities and activities. The Ombudsman must have the power to allocate funding according to his or her priorities. The resources, of the, uh, the resources must be sufficient to, to appoint enough staff who meet the appropriate standards. Personal independence, the term of office should be laid down by law. It must not be possible to dismiss or suspend an ombudsman prematurely unless exceptional circumstances arise which are provided by law. The selection process must include optimal safeguards that the person to be appointed possesses the necessary professional quality vacations. Thirdly, the Ombudsman's work is a profession. To do his or her work properly, an Ombudsman must possess certain qualities and uh, qualifications. A combination of knowledge, skills and attitude is necessary to, to fulfill the Ombudsman's duties. This is particularly important because there is no specific training such as, such as exists for a profession such as lawyers and medical doctors. Establishing an Ombudsman Institute and continuously creating and maintaining the requirements necessary for its effective functioning and living one are different matters. The former is the responsibility of those in political power in the country. The latter, living in an Ombudsman Institution is the responsibility of the incumbent. He, she must ensure that he or she attains the highest standard, uh, uh, the highest possible standard of performance without bias and with complete integrity. His or her integrity and credibility must be beyond reproach. 
in this regard, a margin or sin portion, even if the ombudsman and staff possess all the professional requirements, this does not in itself guarantee that they will execute their mandate optimally. After all, the manner in which they, uh, they can execute their mandate is partly determined by the organization in which they operate. The scope afforded by the organization itself determines the net result of the ombudsman work. We all know, every ombudsman knows from experience the degree to which the financial resources placed at his or her disposal affect his or her work. Fourthly, accessibility. I make the case that every person has the right to complain and the right of access to the ombudsman. Through our work, we have raised uh, these rights to fundamental rights. However, it is poor consolation for a person to know uh, that he or she has these rights, but cannot enjoy them. In a country, in many countries like my own, it is necessary to establish a presence uh, that is close to the pe people because of the sheer size of the country. Regional or branch offices with permanent, permanent staff are arguably the most effective approach to give all persons equal access to the courts. Uh, management of information. Most, if not all, ombudsman officers suffers, suffer from an abundance of complaints that have to be attended to with limited resources. The complaints received are also about a multitude of matters pertaining to a variety of government ag agencies and officials. The management of inform information is an, is an essential component in the case man management systems of ombudsman's offices. Technology, especially computer uh, technology, can be effectively use, utilized as a tool in this regard. Information technology is, a is in a constant state of evolution and development. Therefore, ombudsman officers must keep abreast of such developments. Six, annual report or reports. The ombudsman reports annually to the parliament about the activities of his or her office during the year under review. Most of the annual report and special report contain recommendations for the purpose of a decision and enforcement uh, of these recommendations by Parliament. By helping the Ombudsman with the implementation of his or her recommendation, Parliament accords the assistance that is necessary for the protection of the independence, dignity and effective, effectiveness of the Ombudsman as required uh, by many of our constitution. Seven, the court. And in, in an expensive tool to have our recommendations in, enforced, but sometimes a necessary uh, uh, tool. The ombudsman is currently before the court to, uh, with an application to the court to hold a, a minister uh, to camp contempt of court for failing to comply with a court order. Uh, you all can see to what extent, extent ombudsman must uh, uh, go in order to have some powers or use the powers available to have his or her recommendation recommendations implemented. In, conclusions, late, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, it is important for Parliament and par particular the Parliamentary Standing Committee concerned with Ombudsman Affairs, not only to consider, debate and discuss the Ombudsman's reports, but to take responsibility for registering trends in the development of the public ad administration, which necessitate which necessitate changes in the ombudsman institution. The ombudsman must therefore take the in initiative 
to ensure that necessary changes to the institutions are carried out. Such changes will not only require financial resources, but many may also require amendments to the enabling legislation. A free press and a vibrant civil society are necessary, are necessary to strengthen the might of the Ombudsman in promoting good governance. I thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much, um, Honorable Advocate Waters, for a very um, informative presentation, but also for um, donating five minutes of your time to the session. So you, were, you actually kept it within the, the, the prescribed time. Thank you so much for that. Quite interesting from your presentation. Um, the, the first that I've noted is the point you made about uh, the inferred duties that you've taken on as Ombudsman of Namibia, where you take up complaints on your own volition. I could say the same for um, the Ombudsman of Malawi. And I think that's one way of strengthening our mandates, which is um, sort of to innovate, to purposefully interpret that which the constitution accorded to us. Otherwise, if we restrict ourselves to strict interpretation of the text in the constitution, I think we are going to remain unduly limited. So that's something that I, I find interesting. Um, you've listed a number of tools that are at our disposal for strengthening our mandates. And what I find quite interesting is the engagement that we must have with parliament. And that begs a lot of questions than answers. When one looks at the nature of parliaments that we have, this could be uh, this, the example for Malawi. I could be speaking for Malawi here, but you have partisan politics in our parliaments. You have capacity issues in our parliaments. So by the time you're submitting your reports, by the time you're engaging, how do we also make sure that the other side parliament is equally prepared to look at our reports, synthesize the contents, and really effectively work with us in strengthening our mandates, in, in ensuring that our um, determinations are being complied with. So how do we navigate the partisan nature of politics in our parliaments? The fact that there could be some capacity limitations. I would like for you to keep this at the back of your mind, when we, I will be giving you a chance to, 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 to look at some of the questions that are coming from the participants. Without much ado, and in the interest of time, I would like us to now invite um, Honorable Emon from the Ombudsman of Austria. He is giving us a recorded video presentation on um, the Venice principles, as well as the UN resolution on the promotion and protection of um, the Ombudsman office. Um, Marion, if you can kindly share the video presentation with us, I, I do hope that that can also be accommodated in 10 minutes, then we'll, we'll, we'll leave a lot of room for questions and answers. Marion. Frankie, Marion, good. Fisher sound. I hope you are working on the sound, Marion. From my end, we can't seem to be able to hear the Honorable Ombudsman. And now can you hear? To get tools that should not yes. be under, underestimated. Now in order. Will you replay it from the start? My apologies. Still no sound. 
Ja. Can you hear now? No, still no sound. And it's showing the sound on my side. Frankie, see if you can do it on your side, please. Share computer Let sound. Okay, I'll stop share and start again. Mm -hmm. My apologies. It's me, Marianne. Okay. Dear colleagues, uh -huh. thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this webinar. The African Ombudsman Research Center did a wonderful job in bringing us all together the limitations we experience because of COVID-19, especially in challenging times like these. It is important that the Ombudsman community continues to be in touch. And knowledge are tools that should not be under underestimated in terms Frankie? We have completely lost the video. Um, we seem to be having Arion, Frankie? An alternative, Marion, I, I think um, we had uh, the presentation beforehand. Would anyone be able to read through it in the interest of time, yourself or Frankie? Um, let me just pull it out. My apologies. It's understood. Yeah. It's um, some of the challenges of um, technology the limitations. Apologies to all the participants. This is uh, just a hitch, but we should be able to resolve it. Marion, are you able to retrieve the presentation and maybe give it a quick run through? I'm trying to send it to Shakila now uh, so that she can play it. Okay, in which case? Um, I don't have the, uh, what the, um, sorry, Advert, Honorable Grace, I don't have the uh, presentation printed. I'm mm -hmm. just, I'm, I'm sending it to she, Shakila, she's playing it now. Okay, thank my you. Let's see how bed. that works. My, 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 okay. my internet is bad, but can I try to play again? Is, is that you, Frankie? Um, yes, you can hardly, you've lost you can... me. My, my, internet, my internet connection was bad. Can I try to play again? Okay, let's, let's okay. give it um, the next minute and see what happens i could okay. go to the questions and start reading them out so you've got one minute let's see what happens all right so frankie what i would do you give me a heads up when you are ready to play okay good contribution Ombudsman make.
to the promotion and protection of human rights and to forming a stronger alliance with the United Nations in general. The most important achievement of the United Nations Working Group concerns the UN Resolution on Ombudsman and Media Institutions. The group analyzed the existing resolution to see if needed amending to achieve positive change for the institutions way Ombudsman perceived at the UN level. In December 2020, the UN General Assembly unanimously now in my country UN resolution with most contribution to this webinar. I would like to focus on two important instruments with regard to its topic, tools to strengthening the Ombudsman mandate, namely the UN resolution on the rule of Ombudsman and mediator institutions in the promotion and protection of human rights, good governance, and the rule of law, and second, the Council of Europe's principles on the protection and promotion of the Ombudsman institution, the Venice principles in brief. Besides, I will also share information about the UN Working Group of the International Ombudsman Institute. In 2018, the IOI established a UN Working Group with a view to enhance the visibility of ombudsman institutions at the UN level. Its aim is uh, to raise awareness about the important contribution ombudsmen make to the promotion and protection of human rights and to forming a stronger alliance with the United Nations in general. The most important achievement of the United Nations Working Group concerns the UN Resolution on Ombudsman and Media Institutions. The group analyzed the existing resolution to see if it gave due credit to Ombudsman institutions or if it needed amending to achieve positive change for the way Ombudsmen are perceived at the UN level. In December 2020, the UN General Assembly unanimously adopted the UN resolution with most of the IOI's proposed amendments included. The IOI was also very pleased that the UN resolution st strongly endorsed uh, the so-called Venice Principles. The Venice Principles represent the first internationally recognize standards and principles for the protection and promotion of ombudsman offices. The Council of Europe developed and adopted them in 2019 to advocate the establishment of strong, independent ombudsman institutions. Right at the beginning of the newly adopted UN resolution, it is noted that the General Assembly acknowledges the Venice Principles. And it continues in Article 2A, which strongly encourages member states to consider the creation or the strengthening of independent and autonomous ombudsman and mediator institutions, consistent with the principles on the protection and promotion of the ombudsman institutions. This is considerable and significant success for the first time. A UN resolution provided strong endorsement of the Venice principles and established those as the new global standard for ombudsman institutions. Why are the UN resolution and the Venice principles such powerful tools to strengthening independent ombudsmen? Before UN bodies prioritize the work of the NHRIs to some extent. This is due to a lack of awareness and knowledge of the concept of ombudsmanship and the work we do. With the newly adopted UN resolution, we have made a significant step towards an adequate recognition of ombudsmen and mediator institutions at the UN level. 
The new resolution contains no reference to NHRIS, thus putting a specific focus on ombudsman and mediator institutions. This makes it a much stronger and uh, a much stronger tool to strengthen ombudsman offices. And it's now finally, and it's now finally our document, if you will. It acknowledges the ombudsman's rule in promoting good administration, human rights, good governance, and of course the rule of law. The UN resolution itself provides clear reference to what member states are encouraged to do when establishing ombudsman offices or when interacting with them. The Venice principles likewise stipulate desirable powers and rights of ombudsman institutions and elaborate them further. The UN resolution encourages member states to consider the creation or the strengthening of independent and autonomous ombudsman and mediator institutions. They should be consistent with the Venice principles. Ombudsman offices can either be national human rights institutions or exist alongside them. The, the resolution also underlines the importance of their autonomy and independence from the executive or juridical branches of the government, its agencies or political parties. It urges states to take the appropriate steps to ensure that adequate protection against coercion, reprisals, intimidation or threat, including from other authorities, exists for ombudsman institutions. Acts against those are to be promptly and duly investigated and the perpetrator hold accountable. This is important to enable ombudsman offices to consider all issues related to their fields of competence without threat to their functioning, procedural ability or efficiency. Obviously, the protection of ombudsman officials against any threat that may threaten the physical safety and security is impl implied in that demand. Furthermore, the UN resolution emphasizes uh, the significance, significance of financial and administrative independence and stability of ombudsman institutions. Article 14 of the Venice Principle states clearly, the ombudsman shall not be given nor follow any ins instruction from any authorities. Apart from independence and security, it is also crucial that ombudsman institutions are provided with the appropriate powers and means to work and fulfill their tasks. Adequate financial allocation for staffing and other budgetary needs are equally important as the endowment with the necessary constitutional and legislative framework. State support and protection are essential to ombudsman offices as well, together with a broad mandate across all public services, those powers and means ensure that ombudsman offices can exercise of their mandate efficiently and independent. In other words, they should be equipped with everything they need to select issues, resolve more administration, investigate thoroughly and communicate results. Moreover, to strengthen the legitimacy and credibility of action of ombudsman offices are mechanisms for the promotion and protection of human rights and the promotion of good governance and respect for the rule of law. Article 20 of the Venice Principles states the importance of providing sufficient and independent budget resources of ombudsmen. This is necessary to ensure full independent and effective discharge of its responsibility and functions. Due to that, the Ombudsman shall be consulted and asked to present a draft budget for the coming financial year. Beyond being granted an adequate budget, it is certainly essentially for the Ombudsman office to have sufficient staff and appropriate structural flexibility. For this reason, Article 22 of the Venice Principle requires that the Ombudsman shall be able to recruit his or her staff. Moreover, 
institution may include one or more deputies appointed by the Ombudsman. It is of utmost importance to provide for the clear mandate of Ombudsman. As this enables the prevention and appropriate resolution of any unfairness and maladministration and the promotion and protection of human rights. So Article 16 of the Venice Principle states that the Ombudsman shall have uh, discretionary power on his or her own initiative or as a result of a complaint. This is necessary to investigate cases with due regard to available administrative re remedies. Hence, uh, the Ombudsman shall be entitled to request the cooperation of any individuals or organizations who may be able to assist in the investigation. This includes a legally enforceable right to unrestricted access to all relevant documents, databases, and materials, including those which might otherwise be legally privileged or confidential. Beyond that, Article 16 comprises the right to unhindered access to buildings, institutions, and persons, including those deprived of liberty. In playing also the power to interview or demand written explanations of officials and authorities. In contrast to the means and competences with which states should endow ombudsman institutions, the Venice principles are stipulating the responsibility of ombudsmen to report. Ombudsmen are out to report to the parliament on the activities of the institution at least once a year. Thus, Ombudsman Office can inform the Parliament on lack of compliance by the public administration and sp specific issues as seen appropriate. The report on their activities, as may be appropriate, may include both generally and on specific issues. Additionally, the report shall be made public, be duly taken into account by the author authorities. Those two documents, namely the UN Resolution and the Venice Principles, form an anonymously, enormously wide instrument for actively demanding global recognized standards for ombudsmen. Beyond that, the UN Resolution stresses the importance of international cooperation between ombudsman offices and mediators. It recalls the role played by regional and international associations of ombudsmen and mediator institutions in promoting cooperation and sharing best practices. Likewise, it advertises engagement with the International Ombudsman Institute, the Global Alliance of Human Rights, rights institutions, and other regional networks and associations. Certainly, the collaboration with the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner of Human uh, Rights is promoted as well exchanging experiences, lessons learned, and best practices are mightly and valuable tools to strengthen ombudsman institutions worldwide. Moreover, the resolution encourages ombudsman institutions to cooperate with relevant states, bodies, and develop cooperation with civil society organizations. This should happen without compromising their autonomy or independence. Another tool to strengthen ombudsman the resolution holds is to conduct awareness raising activities on the rules and functions of ombudsman. Finally, I would like to highlight the fact that the UN resolution also concerns ombudsman under threat. Compared to the provision documents, the newly adopted resolution now clearly addresses this issue, calling for measurements against uh, threats regarding their independence, credibility, budgets, or the safety of the office holders. This topic has unfortunately accompanied the international ombudsman community in recent years and will continue to do so for some time to come. It is therefore very gratifying that we now have those two instruments in our hands that clearly and 
quickly demand that ombudsmen should not be exposed to threats and or reprisals. Article 23 of the Venice Principle states, the ombudsman, the deputies and the decision-making staff shall be immune from legal process in respect of activities and words spoken or written carried out in their official cap capacity for the institution. In Article 24, it continues, states shall refrain from taking any action aiming at or resulting in the suppression of the Ombudsman institution or in any hurdles to its effective functioning and shall effectively protect it from any such threats. As an organization representing Ombudsman offices around the world, the IOI considers this a great development and achievement. With these two documents, the Venice Principles and the UN Resolution, the IOI now has two very important tools available to support Ombudsman colleagues who come under threat or operate under difficult circumstances. What is our way forward? As our way forward, we need to make sure that the newly adopted resolution has impact. The IOI has re-established its UN Working Group in May 21, and the group will continue its work and identify ways in order to translate the provisions of the resolution into concrete action. Due to the fact that uh, there are ombudsman institutions that are not no about the resolution, as was the case, for example, in the Pacific region. An important new objective of the working group is to disseminate knowledge about the UN resolution. Dear colleagues, another goal worth highlighting that the UN working group has set itself is to measure understanding of the UN resolution among IOI members. Thus is developing a guide to the UN resolution to promote understanding of best practices for the Ombudsman institution. Article 2 of the resolution, for example, calls for developing and carrying out outreach activities at the national level and collaborating uh, with all relevant stakeholders in order to raise awareness of the important role of ombudsman and mediator institutions. The IOI will seek uh, to become more active in organizing such activities and example giving uh, facilitate awareness raising activities at the regional level and close cooperation with regional partners organizations such as the AOMA. Today's webinar is a first and very important step as it allows us to make the existing of this very important document and tool known to a broader public. With the Venice Principles and the UN Resolution on Ombudsman and Mediator Institutions, our mission and vision and our most important priorities will be easier to implement. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much um, in absentia to Honorable Emon for that very incisive uh, presentation, unpacking the Venice principles, but also the recent resolution from the UN on promotion and protection of the Ombudsman mandate. When you look at the three presentations, there's um, actually some common threads that are running through the presentations. And um, I think the presentation from Honorable Emon captures the ens essence of it all. The strength of the mandate of the Ombudsman lies in um, safeguarding 
the very independence of our institutions, if, if possible, at the level of the constitution and also safeguarding the financial autonomy. I think we can have our mandates entrenched in the constitutions all we want, but if we have governments that are not funding us adequately, we are not going to move, we are not going to be effective. The power of the ombudsman, the, what, what he referred to as structural flexibility to determine how many staff you have, when to recruit them and for what role can also not be overemphasized. And when he was mentioning that, I was looking at the situation in Malawi where yes, the Ombudsman's Act gives me the power to recruit, but everything is subject to a department in Capitol Hill in government that we call Department of Human Resource Management and Development. And for someone to give you what they call authority to recruit, it can take forever. So how do we reconcile some of these things? And then the final one for me from running through the presentations again is um, our, the power that is in the law for us to report to parliament and how we can reinforce that avenue to strengthen the mandate of ombudsman institutions. Um, at this juncture, ladies and gentlemen, there's quite a lot of questions that have come up. Um, so to our presenters, I uh, will be quickly summarizing the questions for you and I'll be giving you time <clears throat> towards the end to respond to the questions as you also be giving us um, your wrap up thoughts and perspectives. So the first question is about um, the issue of underpinning the appointment of ombudsman in objectivity, integrity and empathy. Considering that we are all appointed by a panel of politicians, how can we remove the role and functions of the ombudsman from objectivity and bias? I mean, from, from subjectivity, how can we ensure objectivity considering that ultimately we are appointees of, from a political process? Um, there's a question about nomenclature, which I think has, has always been clarified. Why do we refer ourselves as ombudsman and not ombudsperson? I think that can also be reclarified. How can we guarantee the independence of the ombudsman when the doctrine of separation of powers is not at play at all in most of our jurisdictions. Are all ombudsmen in different parts of the world appointed or is there a case somewhere where they are elected to the posts? Sixth question, specifically to Honorable Caroline Soconi, how is the office of the public prosecutor, I, sh I should take that to mean public protector, of Zambia handling the interference of the three branches of the government. Seventh question, how can the office of the Ombudsman avoid interference of the executive and maintain its independence in a highly politicized government? I think this is the same as the first question that we had. Um, a question from anonymous attendee is, um, do we really think a constitutional amendment is indispensable in securing the required powers and independence that an ombudsman institution needs to effectively carry out our functions. This question is with reference to the Venice principles that UN member states should comply. So in other words, should we just be looking at amending our founding statutes, the Ombudsman Act in our jurisdictions, or we must pitch this at the highest level of the constitution. I'm sure we all know the challenges of getting constitutional amendment processes going and concluded. Would we rather focus on the constituting acts, in this case, the Ombudsman's Act, or we want to pitch this at the level of the constitution? What would be the limitations? What would be the value adding? Um, I have other questions in the chat session, which, uh, from the Deputy Ombudsman of the Republic of Angola, if you can keep noting Advocate Waters and um, um, Honorable Sokoni. The first is, which are the Ombudsman's alternative mechanisms to ensure that his recommendations are followed, given his lack of decision binding power? Um, Honorable Sokoni, you touched on this. Quite interesting that Zambia has a 
the binding legal powers embedded in the constitution, but the courts have over time decided otherwise. What alternatives do we have to ensure that nonetheless, our decisions are complied with, our decisions are binding? Um, in terms of good practice, can criminalizing the duty of non-cooperation be a factor of enforcement uh, of the Ombudsman's mandate? So I seem to recall, for example, that the Ombudsman Act for Malawi has specific sanctions for people that do not comply with our processes. Does that add value to enforcement of our powers? The third and last one is what is the relevance of the relationship with the media? And I can't seem to be able to scroll down, but basically there is an opportunity for our two presenters to address us on um, the relevance of a relationship, not just with the media, but pretty much the broader um, stakeholder, the diversity of stakeholders that we have. Is, is that also a tool, is that also an avenue of um, strengthening the mandates that we have? From the video presentation, we can already see how collaboration, even at the international level, has gained us recognition as ombudsman offices at the UN level. I do hope that Honorable Advocate Waters and Honorable Sokoni you have taken note of the question. Um, Honorable Busisi Wenkwebane, my sincerest apologies for mispronouncing your name at the start of uh, the conversation. I would also, with your indulgence, like to put you on the spot in that as um, Advocate Waters and uh, Honorable Caroline are responding, maybe I could also give you room to chip in and share your perspectives on some of the questions. So the floor is open. I'll start with you with, with the order that we started. So um, Advocate Caroline Sokoni, in the next uh, three or so minutes, if you can give us quick thoughts on the questions and also you're wrapping up our perspectives on the topic that we've been discussing in the interest of time. I think we should ask Advocate Walter because we've lost all of about Sokoni. She's still trying to, 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 to join. To, so can we start with Advocate Walters? Sure. I didn't notice that. Ad, uh, Honorable Advocate Walters, you have the floor. Thank you, Grace, but you would, uh, 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 please don't call me honorable. Uh, let me start at the, the last question, which is the easiest one. Uh, relevance uh, of uh, relations with the media and civil society. The Paris principles of which you heard from Secretary General uh, uh, require that uh, uh, National Human Rights Institution, and I would make it uh, uh, also uh, to ombudsman that we should cooperate with uh, other ombudsman institutions, uh, national human rights institutions and civil society. Co uh, uh, cooperation is not just a need, it is a requirement because uh, through the, if you just take uh, the, uh, the example of this webinar, we have learned something which uh, strengthen our own uh, insights in our own work, which can lead to a uh, 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 betterment of our own uh, 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 processes. So that is, is it. but you need a vibrant civil society uh, uh, and you need a free press. If the society, civil society uh, do not support the ombudsman, do not raise their support to the ombudsman and the media are silent, then uh, 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 we, are, uh, we are just uh, 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 fighting a losing battle to convince the, the, uh, uh, those in political power to uh, accept and implement our recommendation. Criminalization is out of uh, 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 order. Uh, let me explain why. I believe in my country, and I believe in many of our country, the criminal justice system is so overwhelmed with uh, uh, with a huge backlog on criminal cases. And none of us will go and stand at, in, in, in a line to wait for our turn to testify in a matter. So there should be other ways in order to, to, 
to have our recommendations enforced. But we as ombudsman must also ensure that our recommendations are succinct and evidence-based. If, if, if you just make a, a recommendation for the sake of recommendations, nobody will follow it. Yeah. And unfortunately, as Grace, as you already alluded to, our parliaments uh, uh, are too weak and they failed uh, uh, that duty to, to, to support the, the ombudsman and, and discussing, debating uh, uh, our report and help us to enforce uh, uh, these recommendations which we made, which the uh, public administration and, and, and its officials failed to Im implement. Why are we called uh, ombudsman person, uh, men and not ombudspersons? In some, in some jurisdiction, women are preferred to be called ombudsman women. That is a choice of uh, every institution, how it when, uh, uh, wants to name, or every country, how it wants to name its institution. Uh, uh, ombudsman is a, a, a constitutional office in Namibia and so in many other countries. So it's up to the country to exercise uh, that choice. Uh, how can we ensure objectivity, uh, impartiality from political leaders? I, uh, I, I believe through our work, uh, 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 how we engage, how we uh, 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 in our own environment, our objectives, our objective, uh, 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 um, our our recommendations is not biased, and we 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 uh, as I said, our recommendations are based on on facts which nobody can dispute, and and as I said that. Uh, if we make that recommendation to an institution uh, or, or a report to the institution, always to give them the opportunity to put their side of the story before we make that final uh, fact finding or uh, recommendation. That is in, in, in brief how I can uh, answer to the uh, uh, questions. Thank you so much, Advocate Waters, um, for, for the responses. Quite thought-provoking, I must say. And um, maybe this is a conversation that um, needs to continue in other forums at a later stage. Um, Advocate, uh, Honorable Caroline Sokoni, I now give you the floor. Three minutes, three to five minutes. If she's not available, um, Honorable Advocate Busis Wenkwebane, Ah, okay, so we'll start with Honorable Caroline, then we'll come to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, for the question, removing politics out of the role and functions of the Ombudsman, and how can we ensure objectivity? I'm sure um, removing politics out of the whole equation is very, very difficult, but how can we ensure the objectivity um, of, of, of the Ombudsman? First of all, all the, the recruitment process, the, the way the ombudsman is recruited, the way the ombudsman is appointed, and ensuring that the qualities and qualifications of the ombudsman are up to standard. If the constitution lays out a criteria, that must be followed. And the, 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 uh, the, the um, ombudsman must be appointed by the legislature, assuming that that country has got multi-party quality politics in, in play, then it makes it um, a much e e easier to uh, um, appoint the, the, the ombudsman in a transparent and an uh, objective manner. And then, of course, we need support at the international level. The international agreements that are at play, for example, um, the, the, the UN resolutions and the, the Venice principles, um, and the IO, OR TAMBO um, um, uh, standards for uh, uh, the, the establishment of ombudsman offices. These, all these um, um, uh, um, international standards and international agreements and international resolutions, um, they, at some point they need to be enforced internationally. Um, 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 countries need to 
um, uh, be able to sign up to certain agreements to ensure, ensure that they recognize the office of the, the ombudsman and to ensure that they will um, um, adhere to respect the independence and integrity of the office. Then um, the next question, how can we guarantee the independence of the ombudsman and the doctrine of separation of powers is not at play or is not working? Again, I, I, I point to the international agreements. If, for example, if I, I make an example of the OR Tambo um, um, uh, 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 standards, these standards need to be agreed on and signed up by, by all members of the African Union so that they all respect the office of the ombudsman and they all ensure that they protect the, this very important institution, which is there for the most vulnerable, uh, most vulnerable of people. So it doesn't matter um, whether there is, there's multiple party politics or there's single party politics, but if the countries sign up to these um, um, important international instruments, uh, then we'll find that there will, there will be some sort of uniformity in the way ombudsman institutions are treated. I'll also give an example of the, the IOI. The IOI does try using um, uh, um, the, the bylaws to ensure that the country somehow um, 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 respects the office of the ombudsman. So uh, uh, in the same way, the, 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 the United Nations um, uh, resolutions are very, very, very important. But for me, in my own jurisdiction, I find that, for example, even the judiciary does not understand the role of the ombudsman. So that, that's why you find that they are issuing ju judgments where they tr try to either read the, 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 the role of the ombudsman very narrowly or when it suits them very, very broadly. So this is the reason why I, I again said that when they are drawing up the, the articles which establish the, the, uh, the institution of the ombudsman, they all have to be consulted. They all have to cede some power because, for example, the legislature, you are telling them that this whip system, you have to, to, to not use it when it's, uh, uh, the, you're de dealing with matters of the ombudsman because these are your own, own constituents who are complaining about the way the service delivery okay. in government. Even the judiciary, you. you have to tell them, you have to cede some power because some powers, when these matters go to the office of the ombudsman, they are yes. using the principles of natural justice. They are not using the actual principles that you are using in court and we're not using them. We don't use the law books so much. So you have mm -hmm. to cede a little bit of power. Then even the executive, you have to tell them, no, 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 no. You know, you also have to seed, you, you, you have to understand the office of the ombudsman um, um, investigates maladministration. So you mm. cannot say no, you know, this is uh, not politically correct and this is politically correct. So all the three arms of government have to come together, they have to agree and they have to make sure they understand what the role of the ombudsman is. Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable Caroline Sokoni very thought-provoking responses. And I think that also forms a basis on which this conversation just has to continue. Um, we need to find ways of um, going on to engage. If we are going to impress upon the three arms of government to secede some power to us, to understand our mandate, how best do we do that? To get them to a point of understanding and then being amenable to the powers that we have. Otherwise, I think we risk being turned into white elephants of sorts or interpretation of our mandates, like you said, based on the whims or what, what best suits them at a particular point in time, which is a good point at, at which I, I will now go to advocate Busisiwe, um, Honorable Nkwewani, um, Public Protector South Africa, for your thoughts, not only on the questions, but also your wrapping up perspectives. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, um, Honorable Malera, um, Honorable Soponi, Advocate Walter said you mustn't call him <laughs> Honorable, but I think it, it is indeed a thought provoking uh, process. And, uh, you know, um, uh, um, uh, Public Protector Soponi has uh, actually uh, covered it very succinctly. I think uh, the issue of the independence of Ombudsman, public protectors. I think somebody asked why Ombudsman, 
Um, in other countries, they are called mediators. In other countries, it's public protectors. So uh, it's true, depending on how you name them. But the key issue about an ombudsperson uh, uh, or a public protector is that uh, when it was originally thought of, um, well, there's uh, schools of thought saying it was in Sweden, but then others are saying no, um, it's uh, uh, in other countries or Africa. But the main thing is that we are not a court of law, but we are there to assist, um, you know, the three arms of the state to make sure that um, citizens' rights are then protected. But then also the very same uh, 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 three arms of the state are accountable, are responsive. There's no maladministration, there's no corruption. And um, the main thing is that we are provided for in the constitution. And if each country respects its constitution, they would make sure that the public protectors, the ombudsman are respected and they are there for a reason to be a buffer between the two because the court uh, a system or litigation is very expensive. Citizens can access it. I like it that uh, uh, Honorable Sokoni also touched on the legal process of the constitutional court judgment of South Africa. I think the most important thing is that when you read the minority judgment, which she touched on, the minority judgment understands the role of the public protector or of an ombudsman and how we do our work and the processes we follow. And the very same thing that each and every ombudsman or, or, or pro public protector, you cannot be subjected to criminal action, to personal costs, because we do our work and we are protected. I mean, the Venice principles are very clear on that. Each and every of our legislation does have that uh, a, a provision. So I would say, yes, we need to deliberate more. Yes, we need to support each other more. And thank you so much as well to you, facilitator. Your facilitation was uh, spot on. And I think uh, we will receive the recording. Uh, we will continuously engage and we will make sure that we improve as much as possible. And I think I would still insist that make sure that you use your persuasive powers. Maybe uh, to avoid as well being wanting your powers to be binding. Let's go back to the original uh, ombudsman because originally it was how you work closely with state institutions. Uh, when we have findings, sit down with them, take the remedies or recommendations with them so that when you issue your report, it's easy for them to implement. We avoid this thing of uh, being antagonistic and being taken to court unnecessarily. I think let's strive always to do that. Some of us, unfortunately, we are bogged down into now being uh, 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 issuing remedies, which some take it as if it's court orders. But I think with time, people will understand that we are here actually to cover their back because we operate like a kidney. People are coming to us because we are accessible and we bring their cries to uh, the executive. And I think the executive should understand that we are here to support them. We are here to strengthen them so that they'll be able to deliver to their masses. Uh, so I think uh, that's uh, all I can say from my side. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for those remarks, um, quite insightful. And I, I think as we'll be continuing the conversations, it will be interesting to keep learning more from, from the South African experience and other experiences on, you know, also how do you draw the balance between uh, working on your persuasive powers or moral suasion as, as we call it, but in the event of formidable challenges um, against some, some of the departments in governments, you know, how do you, how do you bite a little, if I can call it that? Um, and then how do you strike that balance so that you don't appear to be unduly antagonistic, as you put it? At which point, um, with your guidance, Marion, I, I think uh, this should be, should mark, but uh, I'm not going to call it an end. I think this is a sort of an adjournment of this conversation, it shall have to continue. 
at an appointed date. I would like to think that um, Professor MacArthur will be maybe addressing us or colleagues from the Secretariat. But uh, very quickly, I think what, what this webinar has shown us that we are living in, in a time and moment where our mandates simply have to be strengthened. Uh, various of our institutions have come of age. We have done all the learning that needs to be consolidated for us to become even more effective than what we have been before. A common thread that has run through the three presentations and also from the remarks is the need to safeguard our independence, if possible, through legislation. Um, also, the tools that are there at our disposal. How can we innovate and use these tools effectively? Number one, the very legislation on which we are founded. For some of us, even the constitutional provisions. Number two, parliament, for which we are duty bound to give our reports. How can we make that an effective avenue for purposes of strengthening our mandates? Number three, the courts. Yes, on some days we have celebrated, on some days we have come back feeling let down, but how best do we utilize the courts as the forum for strengthening our mandates? The UN resolutions, the various principles that are available, issues around collaboration have been emphasized. Um, as a parting shot, I would re repeat uh, something that has come up from um, the presenters which is the integrity of our decision-making processes, as well as the content of our decisions. If that is evidence-based, if that is based on undisputable facts, we are likely to get compliance. We are likely to get a win-win situation with the various people on which we issue our determinations. It's been a pleasure and a privilege for me to facilitate this session. I've been learning in the process. So all mistakes, I take responsibility, except for the technical hitches. And really it remains for me to say, <laughs> thank you so much everyone for sticking around up to the very end. And as we'll be going to lunch, some of us, bon appetit, um, maybe some people are in afternoon, I realize the different time zones, at which point I would like to hand over to the organizers, Frankie, Marion, Thank you so much for putting up a very well organized webinar and uh, to all our panelists thank you so much for sharing with us your perspectives i do hope that our uh, prof is still around to finally wrap up or secretary uh, you can uh, guide us thank no. you no prof had to excuse himself because he had other commitment but we are the one to say thank you for everything thank you for these discussions and maybe just to say to the participants it's not your discussion by the way your email your thoughts your if you still have other questions uh, our panelists will be able to answer and will answer to email any question that was not addressed we will post on our website the answers so with panelists and we will come back to you we'll need you again because as my own boss, the public protector, honorable everyone, I always this is our own mind. So we will come back to you. Thank you so much. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you